Hello everyone, I am Dr. Lakshmi Gayatri. Parotid gland is the largest salivary gland present in our body on either side of the head. All the salivary glands develops during the 5th to 6th week of intrauterine life as the ectodermal outpouchings into the surrounding mesenchyme. This parotid gland is the last gland to get encapsulated and hence it encloses the lymph nodes within it. That is why this gland has the intraparenchymal lymph nodes. Because of these intraparenchymal lymph nodes, the salivary epithelial cells get embedded within these lymph nodes and hence these lymph nodes become the common site for the Vardin tumors and the lymphoepithelial cyst. So with this introduction, we will discuss about the gross anatomy and the surgical anatomy of the parotid gland. The three paired salivary glands being parotid gland, submandibular gland and sublingual gland. Among these, the largest is the parotid gland. This gland is shaped like an inverted pyramid and it weighs about 25 to 30 grams in weight. This gland is predominantly having serous acini and hence it contributes for the aqueous nature of the saliva. Its secretions increases when it is stimulated by food which helps in the chewing, deglutition and swallowing of the food. The parotid bed or the parotid mold is a facial line space which contains the parotid gland. This parotid bed is bounded by the following structures. In front, it is having the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible with the masseter and the medial pterygoid on its medial aspect. Posteriorly, Mastoid process and the sternocleido mastoid bounds it. Above it is bounded by the external acoustic meatus, below by the posterior belly of the digastric muscle and medially by the styloid process and its muscles. The parotid gland during its development will be the last salivary gland to get encapsulated as I have already told you. The coverings of the parotid gland are inner true capsule and outer false capsule. The true capsule, as in all other structure, is formed by the condensation of the fibrous drum of the gland itself. The false capsule is otherwise called as parotid sheath, is formed from the investing layer of deep cervical fascia. This fascia, when it reaches the apex of the parotid gland, splits into a superficial lamella and a deep lamella. The superficial lamella covers the superficial surface of the parotid gland. This lamella is very strong and it gets attached to the lower border of the zygomatic arch and also blends with the epimyceum of the masseter muscle to form the thick parotidomasseteric fascia. The deep lamella covering the deeper part of the gland is a thinner layer and is attached to the tympanic plate and the styloid process of the temporal bone. The part of the deep lamella which is attached to the styloid process will become thickened to form the stylomandibular ligament which extends from the tip of the styloid process to the angle of the mandible. This ligament is the one which separates the parotid gland from the submandibular gland. We have seen the parotid bed structures and the coverings of the parotid gland. Now let's see the presenting parts of the parotid gland. The gland is an inverted pyramid shaped structure so it has the lower end or the apex and the upper part or the base. It has three surfaces namely superficial, anteromedial and posteromedial surfaces separated by three borders which are anterior, posterior and medial borders. Now we will see the relations in each part. This picture represents the lateral view of the parotid gland where we can see the relations of the apex, base, the anterior border and the posterior border. The apex of the parotid gland is related to the anterior and the posterior divisions of the retromandibular vein where the anterior division along with the facial vein forms the common facial vein and the posterior division with the posterior auricular vein forms the external jugular vein. Also, the apex is related to the last terminal branch of facial nerve, namely cervical branch of facial nerve. The base of the parotid gland is directed above and related to the external acoustic meatus. It is related to the temporal branch of the facial nerve, the superficial temporal vessels and the auriculotemporal nerve. 
The anterior border of the parotid gland is a thin border and it separates the superficial surface from the anterior medial surface of the gland. There are so many structures related to the anterior border. From above downwards it is the zygomatic branch of the facial nerve, the transverse facial vessels, upper buccal branch of facial nerve, accessory parotid gland along with the parotid duct, the lower buccal branch of facial nerve and the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. The posterior border separates the superficial surface from the posterior medial surface of the gland. It is related to the posterior auricular branch of facial nerve and the posterior auricular vessels. This border rests on the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The medial border separates the anterior medial surface and the posterior medial surfaces of the parotid gland. It is related to the wall of the pharynx. Hence, this border is also known as the pharyngeal border. Next, we will see about the surfaces of the parotid gland. For this, we need to see the gland in a horizontal view. This picture represents the horizontal view of the parotid gland where we can see the superficial surface, the anterior medial surface, the superficial and the anterior medial surface separated by the anterior border. This is the posterior medial surface where the superficial surface and the posterior medial surface are separated by the posterior border. Now we can also see the medial border which separates the posterior medial and the anterior medial surfaces. Let's see the relations of each surfaces. The superficial surface of the parotid gland is covered from the external to the internal by the skin, superficial fascia with the fibers of the platysma and the superficial lamella of the parotid sheath derived from the deep cervical fascia. The superficial fascia also contains the parotid group of lymph nodes. We can also see the greater auricular nerve which supplies the skin over the angle of the mandible. Next, we will see the anterior medial surface which is deeply grooved. This surface is related to the ramus of the mandible along with the two muscles. One is the posterior inferior part of masseter in its outer surface and the insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle in its inner surface. Lastly, we can see the posterior medial surface which is very extensive and is related to so many structures. They are the mastoid process along with the sternomastoid muscle and the posterior belly of digastric, the styloid process along with the styloid group of muscles. Deep to the styloid process, we can also see the internal carotid artery in the front and the internal jugular vein behind with the last four cranial nerves intervening between them. We can also see the facial nerve related to this surface when it emerges from the stylomastoid foramen. So these are the relations of the different parts of the parotid gland. The processes of the parotid gland are nothing but the extensions of the gland. One such process called facial process is present superficial to the masseter muscle which is triangular in shape. Accessory parotid gland is a small detached part of the main gland which is present between the zygomatic arch and the parotid duct is also considered as a process of the gland. Another process called pterygoid process is present from the deeper part of the gland between the mandibular ramus and the medial pterygoid muscle. Glenoid process is the one which extends upwards present between the external meatus and the temporomandibular joint. Similarly, Pre and post styloid process are also the extensions of the gland which is related to the styloid process of the temporal bone. It is important to know about the deep structures of the gland because it has some surgical importance. The structures present within the gland from outside to inwards are facial nerve and its branches, the retromandibular vein and the external carotid artery, the artery being the deepest. The parotid gland is divided into superficial and deeper lobes by a plane called patty's fasciovenous plane. This plane appears in the form of an isthmus, so the gland in a coronal section appears in an H-shaped manner. The facial nerve passes through the isthmus in the middle. So this subdivision helps the surgeon to remove a parotid tumor leaving the nerve intact. Thus, the patty's fasciovenous plane of the parotid gland has its surgical importance. Parotid duct The parotid duct is also called as a Stenson's duct, which is 5 cm in length. The duct emerges through the anterior border of the gland and first it passes forward on the masseter muscle. 
As it reaches the anterior border of the masseter, it abruptly turns medially through the buccal pad of fat and then pierces the buccopharyngeal fascia and the buccinator muscle. The duct then passes obliquely between the buccinator muscle and the mucous membrane of the cheek and finally opens in the vestibule of the mouth opposite to the crown of the upper second molar tooth. Blood supply of the parotid gland. The parotid gland is supplied by the posterior auricular branch and the superficial temporal branch of the external carotid artery. And the venous blood is drained by the retromandibular vein and the external jugular vein. Lymph from the gland is drained into the superficial and deep group of parotid lymph nodes. The efferent vessels from these nodes finally drains into the jugulodigastric group of deep cervical nodes. Nerve supply of the parotid gland. The secretor motor supply of the gland is derived from both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nerves. The parasympathetic innervation starts from the inferior salivatory nucleus present in the medulla as the preganglionic parasympathetic fibers, which passes successively through the tympanic branch of glossopharyngeal nerve, tympanic plexus, and lesser petrosal nerve which relays in the peripheral parasympathetic ganglion named as otic ganglion. The postganglionic fibers from this ganglion passes through the auriculotemporal nerve and finally reaches the gland to enhance its secretion. The sympathetic fibers arises from the superior cervical ganglion and reaches the gland to give the secretomotor supply and the vasomotor supply by winding around the external carotid artery. Till now we were discussing about the parotid gland under the following topics. The parotid bed, the general features of the parotid gland, its presenting parts and the relations of the various parts, the processes of the gland, the structures passing deep to the gland, parotid duct, the blood supply, lymphatic drainage and the nerve supply of the gland. Now we will see about the surgical anatomy of the parotid gland. The inflammation of the parotid gland is called as parotiditis and it is mostly caused by the viral infection and the condition is called as mumps. The parotid gland is covered by very tough facial sheath and because of this the inflammatory swellings produced by the parotiditis is very painful due to the unyielding nature of the facial cap capsule and also due to the rich sensory nerve supply. A parotid abscess is always drained by a horizontal incision and it is never done by a vertical incision. The branches of the facial nerve within the gland radiates horizontally. The parotid abscess is drained by a small horizontal incision in the parotid fascia to avoid injury to the branches of the facial nerve and this method is called as Hilton's method. If a vertical incision is given it may damage all the branches and hence it is not advisable. In case of any penetrating wounds in the parotid region or due to the incision given during surgeries in the parotid region, a complication called as Frey's syndrome may occur if the auriculotemporal nerve and the greater auricular nerves are cut. The characteristic feature of this condition is that when the patient eats, perspiration appears on the face in the parotid region. This condition is called as Frey's syndrome. The anatomical basis for this phenomenon is that when the auriculotemporal nerve giving the secretomotor innervation to the parotid gland is cut, during its repair it grows out and joins with the fibers of the greater auricular nerve which is meant to supply the sweat glands. Because of this small alignment, when a patient eats, the stimulus will produce sweat production instead of saliva production. Parotid gland tumors may be benign or malignant. Benign tumors or mixed tumors which are slow growing. These benign tumors will never affect the facial nerve. But in case of malignant parotid gland tumors, facial nerve is always affected. Superficial parotidectomy is a procedure carried out to excise the parotid gland tumors. In this surgery, the facial nerve is exposed in a space between the external auditory meatus and the mastoid process. The nerve is raised anteriorly to expose the superficial and deeper lobes of the parotid gland and thereby superficial parotidectomy can be easily carried out without causing facial nerve injury. 
During clinical examination of the parotid gland, the parotid duct opening opposite to the upper second molar tooth is always examined to look for any calculus formation in the duct. Generally, parotid duct calculus is uncommon when compared to the submandibular duct calculus. In case of calculus formation in the parotid duct, Parotid silogram is the investigation of choice where a radio-opaque dye is injected through the opening of the parotid duct and it is examined by x-rays. Thank you.